Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And I'm Tom Scholey. Special guest today to go over the art of Jack Kirby. Before we do that, where can they find more of your work, Tom? Well, um, you can go to any uh, comic book retailer and get Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. It's the story of Jack Kirby's life in the form that he pioneered in the comic book form. Uh, you can um, follow me on Twitter at Tom Scholey. You can check out my um, my Patreon uh, just search Tom Scholey on, on patreon.com. And I also have a YouTube show, Total Recall Show. How about you, Ed? Tell us about Red Room. Red Room Comics out there in the wild. As of June 30th, uh, the second issue is going to be out there. So you know the machine is running. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in the Red Room universe. And we're talking outlaw splatterpunk comics these days. Man, let's bring back some of that 90s energy. Uh, Caliber Comics, never too far from the front of my thoughts. You know what I'm saying, Jimmy? Uh, if you want to read these comics before they hit the paper edition, go to my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks get you the archive there. I'm into the fifth issue of Red Room on uh, on the Patreon. I put up new strips every two, Tuesday. Three bucks gets that archive, and you could pre-order or order the comics uh, through the Fantagraphics website. All these links are in my link tree in the description below. You can join me on patreon.com slash jimrug, where I post a lot of my out-of-print zines and mini-comics. These are some of my most recent zine uploads, uh, things that show the process of how I make Street Angel, as well as uh, notebook drawings, ballpoint pen drawings, things that are just hard to come by in print these days. You can get high-res, uh, download high-res PDFs of these and many more. I think I've got almost a dozen of these zines available at this point. Patreon.com slash jimrug. Jim, it's hot in here. Should we all take our shirts off? <laughs> I really like the way everybody's art is interacting with the uh, Kevin Eastman, Jack Kirby background. Like, you know, there's, there's a nice, you can sort of see like a, like a common wellspring there. It's an interesting bridge uh, getting into this book now. Jack Kirby, the art of Jack Kirby, cover art, obviously Jack Kirby, but Kevin Eastman doing the inks on this beautiful wraparound cover image. Book from 1992, I got this thing when it first came out, and it's uh, it's interesting notes on both ends of that, Tom. One, Kevin Eastman, because I think of him as sort of outside of that mainstream system, so it's kind of awesome to see that approach applied to Jack Kirby. The other part is towards the end of Jack Kirby's life, so I assume this is a new piece by Kirby around this time for the cover, but there's some uh, wonkiness to these figures. You know, it feels like it's towards the end of his run. Well... Here's the thing. The wonkiness, I would say, is delivered by Eastman. I think so, too. <laughs> and be. I love it. I, like, I love this this aesthetic. And again, you know, you talk about Eastman being outside the mainstream, but he kind of is mainstream. Like, I know more people who read Eastman Ninja Turtle comics than have read, like, so-called mainstream comics, you know? And it's just a great interaction. Uh, you know, the wonkiness is, is just beautiful. You know, it really speaks to me. But... This is a composition. These are Kirby drawings, but it's kind of a, uh, a cobbled together collage that um, that Eastman put together and then inked. You know, uh, so this this figure of Calabac is from a a pinup in New Gods that Jack Kirby did of Calabac looking in the mirror and like talking about how beautiful he is <laughs> and so so it's it's like you know kind of interesting in the context of this like epic cosmic battle that's going on between the forces of good and evil. But like, I, I recognize, you know, several of, of these as, you know, uh, you know, just pulled out of like a Jack Kirby comic. As of this recording, uh, it's going to be two weeks from now, which is uh, the July, whatever the hell, whenever Rob Liefeld's last issue of Snake Eyes comes out. And, and Eastman came on board towards the end and he, and he inked a page. Eastman can't help but being Eastman. You know what I mean? Like we're we're all doing our best to try to preserve Rob <laughs> stuff and 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 make sure that uh, he doesn't want us to do it over again. But the Eastman page is 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 all Eastman, and he's always been that way. You know what I mean? He he's been his boss from the start, so you can't you can't tell this guy to to conform. And uh, I definitely agree with the the wonky factor as being like the. Uh, the Eastman touch. I wonder if he did the color as well, because I was just thinking that and wondering that because uh, it, it, it isn't that far from like some of the airbrush kind of things, you know, the, like the spatter gimmicks that uh, he would do with, uh, with the covers for these um, Ninja Turtle pieces. And like, look at how like the squat turtles and like, this is the most squat <laughs> Captain America you've ever seen. And 
a, a lot of secondary colors. Well, like yeah, that's color. well, that's a fun thing too, man. Because like you, st you still see the primaries on the good guys, and you see the pinks and the greens and the oranges on the bad dudes. And this like orange and purple background. Yeah, it's a sharp piece. I mm -hmm. I picked this up. It must have been a birthday gift or Christmas gift or something because this was a high ticket item for me in 1992. I was a kid, just kind of getting into comics. Kirby, of course, I knew of, but it was hard to find actual work at the time, at least work that I could afford. And I remember getting this book, you know, like this is my beat up copy. I've had it now for 30 years. Uh, do you guys remember when you picked this up? Was it like, this was like an intro for me to Kirby. Well, that was exactly it, it to me, like in a, in, in a big way. Um, like it was years before I bought it, but I certainly like paged through it on the racks a lot. And this was, you know, I was a freshman in college. I went into Phantom of the Attic and they had like a little Kirby section and it was this, and then maybe like the first couple issues of the Jack Kirby Collector. Like that was a relatively new thing at the same time. And it just like, whoa, like this, that, that was kind of my introduction to like Jack Kirby as Jack Kirby. I'm like, this is the guy. And it was like hitting me in the face. And I remember like specifically seeing the double page splash from Commandy number one that's in here. And that blew my mind. I'm like, wait a second, you know, like, like, what is this? And also like seeing the origin of all these characters that I knew, because again, like a lot of these characters I thought of as Stan Lee characters, or I thought of them as Saturday morning cartoon characters. I didn't know that it was like one guy, you know, as the, the creator or co-creator of all these characters and just flipping through it. And so seeing like the new gods and being like, oh, those are those guys from Super Friends. And then, uh, and this is the guy who created them. And then when I saw that commandy double page splash, I was like, wait a second. Did this guy, like, create Planet of the Apes? Like, because I didn't know the dates or anything. So I'm, I'm like, did this predate Planet of the Apes? And they were ripping them off. And, of course, it's the other way around. But but he, like, amps up. It's like Planet of the Apes on steroids. <laughs> I got this around 92 as as well, Jimmy. And uh, he was an, his was a name that you would hear in interviews and stuff. So you just automatically assume if McFarlane and Liefeld are talking about him. He's got to be an important guy to, to, to know and recognize. You see the dedications in Spawn 1 or whatever to uh, to Jack Kirby, and you see his name mentioned so much. So I had to scoop this thing up. I had some passing knowledge. And this book kind of started, you know, we always make that joke about, like, I'm not quite, I'm not quite uh, his Fantastic Four age yet. I still have time to do my thing. Like, I was 10 years old. I was comparing myself to him <laughs> at age 10, like, okay, setting up all my benchmarks for some reason. And I don't know if I got it from here or something. It was very, very important for me to be a, a professional, like, actually get paid in comics at age 21. And I think it might come from something that I read uh, in in these pages, man. But I've always been kind of, like, trying to keep pace uh, one of my favorite pieces that we'll, we'll see at the very end is the checklist. That, that right. would be like the back of his baseball card if we all had, you know, <laughs> some kind of like trading card or something. And uh, just a, a, a fantastic introduction to the king. Uh, I feel like we should just like stop that filibuster and start cracking these pages open. Yeah, last thing I'll say is it's it's a strange book design. You know, there's no like I, there's no UPC code barcode or anything on here. It just feels like a different era. Is this some Greg Theakston it, shit? It looks so much like Theakston, but I don't think Theakston was involved in this at all. I think I think the the uh, the East Eastman and Theakston are kind of like you know same generation fan you know coming from a fan direction. So I think that's that's the commonality. Blue Rose Press, whatever that is. Yeah, it's it's not something I recognize. And Ray Wyman Jr. Uh, and Catherine Holfield, two names that I don't really know uh, too well in terms of comic scholarship. I don't know whether they've written other books or not, but it's not it's not names that pop off like and, a Greg Feigston. Or... And it, it says the Blue Rose Press, but like we've learned that Kevin Eastman was the publisher of this. He just kind of kept his name oh, off. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he published this. He kept his name off. I forget exactly why. It might have even been like oh, we don't want the stink of the turtles on this Jack Kirby book. It might hurt sales, you know what Shit, I mean? Shit, I was thinking about maybe a little <laughs> bit, uh, you, might be, you might be dry snitching on them after uh, some, like, I, yeah, move, I, the, move the money around, <laughs> like, Tundra thing, maybe a divorce or something like that. That's probably the thing, is keep it away from Tundra. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool, too, because Kirby's still alive when this is done, yeah. which is really nice. So he gets to do some promo, but the book is full of quotes from Kirby. And I wonder, like, I bet a lot of those, or at least some of them were probably contemporary, you know, like they probably yeah. talked to him about yeah, this. Yeah, Wyman sort of sat down with him, did like, you know, an epic interview and, and occasionally like, a, you know, an excerpt from the, like an unseen excerpt from the Wyman 
tapes or the Wyman interview will show up in like an issue with a Kirby collector here and there. That makes perfect sense. You're the perfect guy to sit with us, Tom, while we go through this thing, because I, I'm going to have some questions and I think you might have the answers because we're going through every single piece of this guy's life in, in some cursory way. I haven't gone through this book in a long time, so pulling it off the shelf this week and getting into it, I was surprised by how much like pre-Marvel coverage is in here because mm-hmm. it would have it, it kind of blew my mind this week. And now you know there's been a bunch of biographies of Kirby. There's been the Jack Kirby collector. There's lots of places where you can find Kirby info now. But for me, the first time I heard most of it was probably this book, the original time. And there's so much like golden age and backstory in here. I feel like when we get to the Silver Age, we're just going to blast through yes. it because I mean we've <laughs> we've we've been there, done that a million times. Like, just real quick, can you go to the page before? Because, I mean, for the audio listeners, got to point out, sketchbook material from Jack Kirby's archives from 1937, just drawn portraits of people. And uh, to see the rawness is was a very inspiring for, thing for me at the time. Seeing all of this, like, pre-professional work was crucial in, like, my young artistic development. It's quite a cross-section of uh, celebrity, too, from from Hitler to character actor Aubrey Smith. I mean, it's informative. It's like a snapshot of the era. Because there are those names that get kind of lost, that if you're part of an era, you remember this, that, but it doesn't really make it into you know the history books. There's something about the, the technique here that makes me think that this, this wasn't just a, a jerk-off sketchbook page. Like, there's a little caricature in this. Is he... Is he trying to work up the chops to be an editorial il- illustrator or something like that? I mean, at this point, like going by Kirby's age, I would say he probably was like sem- professional or semi-professional at this point. And he was doing those like Harry T. Elmo comics where he was basically handling like every aspect of like a newspaper comic. So he was doing uh, editorial comics. He was doing Ripley's Believe It or Not style stuff. He was doing funny comic strips, drama comic strips. He was working... Like in a syndicate, right? Like a bullpen syndicate. So he would be doing possibly editorial card. It was whatever the newspapers needed. Yeah. Uh, which could be complete comic strips, but also editorial comics, political comics, or possibly or advertising. Or for, for an ad. It's actually like even worse than that because it was like a bargain basement syndicate where it was like they were selling to to papers that were like Pen, not the penny big, savers yeah sure. not the big paper and so like a lot of some of this stuff that he did in that era like never saw print or like saw print in europe or like just, just added up it ended up in like some really odd places and of course that fa- famous spread from his auto bio story uh which would be done many years later but makes sense here as it's uh based on his childhood yes yeah, street code would have been uh you know relatively new at that at that point yeah, here's a here's a um, portrait of his mother. I imagine he used that in your, in your in your comic. Lots lots of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he did do like little portraits of of you know various people in his life. And, when, yeah. When you see the, these like sort of like you know these boy groups, man, you can't help but think of like Boy Commandos and a Newsboy Legion mm-hmm. and all that. It's really, I found that really interesting going back through this this group, the Boys Brotherhood Republic, also in your book, uh, briefly, Tom, but a local neighborhood group that he gets into. And it's almost like this activist, you know, like you're trying to claw your way out of this, the poverty of the depression and uh, leaning on each other as young men to like try to become professionals in whatever you're doing. After reading Street Code and like seeing this photo, did you look a little close to see if one of them had a hunch? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Even even the name. Awkward pose right here. (laughs) Even the name Boys Brotherhood Republic sounds like, you know, the sort of thing that would inspire like a boy commandos, boys ranch, you know, all those boy groups. There's a lot of that in these intro pages, you know, talking about selling newspapers on the streets, you know, younger than this even, uh, whenever he's very young, kind of just trying to help, trying to do like anything he can. One of the boys is like lighting a cigarette in that photo. <laughs> <laughs> this is another photo of that group. So yeah. I guess a neighborhood based group, but uh, a lot of, and, and I believe it's still active today. That's what I was going to say. I, yeah. As far as I know, it's, it's, it's still, uh, yeah, active. Um, and then this up here, this is like, this might be his like very first published work or, or one of them. This, this, that was like the mimeographed, um, you know, little newsletter that, that they do in, in, in the Boys Brotherhood Republic. And, and, you know, he put that whole thing together. That's really cool to see one cent. <laughs> don't you love seeing that like something don't you seem to love seeing like the mimeographed stuff of like, you know, great cartoon, yes. like you got the Frank Miller mimeographs and 
I think it's so interesting. It's uh, I'm, I'm thankful for any of that stuff that gets preserved too. Like anytime you actually get to see a page, because how impossible is it that something like that survives to this day? I love the names of some of uh, his brethren in that group, man. And my 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 dad, all his crew have like nicknames and stuff. So uh, Kirby's homies, Maxi, Tootie, and Jakey. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> Yeah, dressed to the to the nines also yes. is real fun. Yeah. yeah, sharp as hell, man. Yeah, it's funny that the cyclical nature of those things, because then it would be like, you know, 20 years later, you'd have like the mods, you know, doing that again as it goes up and down between like dressing like a bum and dressing like a million bucks going in and out of fashion. Every now and then you'd see somebody pull that at a uh, comics convention and it always looks so awkward. <laughs> When they tried to be fly, yeah, <laughs> you know, like I, I won't even name a name, man. But but like we we were on panels with some dapper motherfucker, right, man? And and uh, you know, I, I know I know clothes a little bit, man. Just checking out that gear, it's the shit that you get, like that kids get at, at for the prom. It was his communion suit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying it costs like 150 dollars or less. <laughs> Some of his early work uh, in animation at the Max Fleischer Studios doing in-between work. So I, I, I can't remember if it's in this text, but I always associated this with part of his speed was because he worked in the animation early that, he, you know, the speed was such a vital ingredient to that. I have no idea if that's well, true, but in my head, it's how I linked it. You've got the speed and then you've got the dynamism uh, of, of Kirby, like, you know, like working on Popeye. Don't you think, like, when we think of his stuff, we think of, like, a giant fist in your face and, like, and like fist fights as being, like, the basis. It's, it seems like the perfect, you know, primer. But but let's, I mean, the chastity belt of being the in-betweener. He's not drawing the keyframes. Like, like in the How to Draw Comics the Marvel way, like, you've got your other guy doing the cock back. Sure. You have your other guy doing the follow-through. And Jack Kirby has to draw all the boring parts <laughs> in between. But, I mean, Talk he, about a chastity belt. He's, he's learning here. And again, it's like, okay, maybe he's doing the boring part, but he's doing also the one frame, the one like split second right before the big punch. So there's really like a negligible difference there. Uh, but yeah, he's he's learning here. And he like clearly put that same like two and two together that you're talking about, Ed. He was like, this is not for me. Yeah. I don't like, yes, I'm being paid well. It's great. I don't want to be uh, like, like. A, just a piece of an assembly line. It's a conversation that we have often about like the, the, the jobber mentality and how you can, you can live a nice life, have a family, have your cars and stuff like that, but you can be a jobber, just a cog in the wheel doing the thing. But there are other people that just have that mindset that they, they need more. He compared it to the garment work yes. that his father did. That's it what was, I was going to say. It, it, I mean, it was sweatshop conditions. Great self-portrait. Yeah, on like some coquille board or something. Now we're starting to see, I think, some of his, uh, that bullpen type work. Mm -hmm. And there's so much of it. Like, Greg Theakston had published, like, you know, complete, you know, volumes of that kind of stuff. There's so much of it. He, I mean, he really has, like, careers within careers. Like, there's so much of it. And it's, um, it's really accomplished. Like, it's, it's really great stuff. Yeah, it's, this it's was the a 10, viable thing. Hours. You look into like the cartooning correspondence courses, this would be a possible outcome. And then you look at a, some of the huge syndicated cart co comic strip guys that would come out of that. You know, like it's almost where you would pluck the talent when it was like, okay, we've got a new strip. We're ready to launch. Who's the top guy in this, in this syndicate bullpen area? And a lot of those guys have their origins or at least a stopover in that, you know, in that position. Uh, it's a foot in the door. It's getting you into that newspaper publishing world. And if you're a young guy, it's a chance to really kind of develop those chops because you are drawing so much different stuff, you know, putting, maybe on the same day. Putting together a, a strong portfolio. I mean, this is a this is a strong illustration. If you look close, you could see the paste ups where, you know, he had to slap that head <laughs> yeah. down over over top of, a, you know, the earlier drawing or something. Yeah, my, my understanding of the 20th century was really informed by my understanding of Kirby and his own particular biography. So you look at this, look at this, like... Um, editorial cartoon in the context of the 20th century and in the context of Jack Kirby's personal story where like in a few years he's going to be fighting these guys yeah it's 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 hard to uh it's so hard to separate that out from like this this is a legend you know I never met Kirby this is mm -hmm. just in my mind this a character uh but putting it in the real context of like yeah and then he goes to war you know whenever he's 23 or something it's hard to process interesting stipple approach where he's using different size dots so I'm imagining like different kinds of pens or whatever like did, did tech pens even exist in 1937 is it all yeah. oil 
I mean, I wonder if that that dot screen is maybe even some kind of board that he's like running like a you know crayon or something across. Mm. Like it's it, yeah, it, it would be you know it would be great to interview him and <laughs> ask these questions. Be shocking if someone would remember something like you know like uh-huh. this is probably a morning job on a Tuesday <laughs> along with three well, other I'll things. Well, I bet even somebody like Steve Rude could tell you like oh no that's such and such a board and I use that on, in Nexus for blah 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 you know craft tent or whatever you know or, or some equivalent of, of craft tent of the day pretty amazing hatching too never really think about him as uh you know inking uh mm-hmm. really but there's some really great inking techniques throughout these these examples yeah figuring out the brush and stuff and and you, you never see kirby ink himself so this is like this is a rare treat and aspiring cartoonists out there like if you want to be a professional like us this is what you have to do you have to do hundreds and hundreds of pages of of editorial <laughs> cartoons in various <laughs> th- before you can draw your first page of yeah fantastic four or whatever you also see him using a lot of different p- uh, pen names yeah. throughout this and and like in that in the harry t elmo studio like that was required because he wanted it to look like he yes. had this like army like doing stuff but it also was kind of you know, typical of the era. And I look at some of these like old sci-fi comics and stuff where they have these like really cheesy, like, you know, it's a pseudonym, pseudonym, you know, where it's like Stargazer, you know, by, you know, like, yeah, right. names like that. And starting to see comic strips mm-hmm. that he would be pulled to do or, uh, you know, and some of these things were even done like syndicate owns all of them. You don't get any benefits. Right. You're getting paid minimally to do these things. Yes. Yeah, so from the start, man, he's not getting paid. So this is Sako the Sea Dog, and he's taking some of his, like, Popeye experience and, you know, bringing it there. It's Popeye with a beard. It's cool to see these and think of him as, like, uh, Mm pre-style or uh, style agnostic, you know, like, what's what's the job call for? There are such tiny, you see the glimmers, you know? Yeah, you see little bits of Kirby in there. And as as we turn the pages, you see more and more. You know, like it, we're we're approaching the Simon Kirby era. I, I see like the Black Buccaneer, and it makes me think of Watchmen's Black Freighter. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and, and I mean, Alan Moore was you know so knowledgeable of like comics history. I wouldn't doubt it. This one, the the Lone Rider, like it, again, if you check out the Feekston book, you can read like the entire sequence of it. And the storytelling in here is actually a lot closer to Kirby's mature storytelling in the '60s and '70s uh, because it's it's like newspaper continuity. So like things unfold and roll in like a very naturalistic way where at the time when Kirby would do stuff for comic books, it would be very clipped, very accelerated, like eight pages and you're out where this, this is a lot closer to his Marvel work in terms of storytelling. And then Cyclone Burke, this was an original creation of Kirby's he created and it was like kind of his Flash Gordon or whatever. And it is kind of like the first instance of this thing we're going to see all through Kirby's career of the sort of sci-fi action adventure hero and, and you see little like uh story elements that that do you know resurface you know time and time again i think of milk kniff a lot when i look at this i always mm-hmm. hear kniff as being an early influence of kirby and you see yeah. these kind of strong shadows and spotting of blacks mm-hmm. and it feels a little kniff like he's a kniffer <laughs> You started with the comic strips, and then you added a little bit more. Then you get to the comic page, right? Yeah, and if he, uh, yeah, then, then you got a comic book. Mm-hmm. And then if, if he had gone even further, like, you, you add a couple hundred pages to that, you got a graphic novel. <laughs> you uh, put, put it on a computer, you got web comics. <laughs> I love it, man. And, of course, the comic book taking off around this time as he's uh, looking for gainful employment and as much as, as he can draw uh, fast artists. So it seemed like, I don't know if he's turned anything down ever, right, uh, yeah. but constantly looking for more and more of that work. And the comic book market opens up, and it's sort of the perfect fit for what his skill set is at that time, combined with the hunger to just have paychecks coming in. Yeah, the age he's at, his restlessness. And and you're right, he didn't turn down a job. He, he took took everything he could get. And, like until he kind of hooked up with Joe Simon and Joe Simon was like, look, you got to pick and choose. I can, I can get it to where you're doing like half as much work, but getting paid more, you know, and, and Blue Bolt is, um, I mean, they did a, a little bit prior to that, um, in sort of like the, I forget the name of the studio, but it's like the, the Cuba Cola studio. It was, uh, names escaping me at the moment, but, uh, but then Blue Bolt was where like, you know, Joe Simon was like, oh, Hey Kirby, you want to help me out? on on you know some some comic books i'm working on and and uh you know they, they so there's like blue bolt number one which is like all simon and then from then on it's it's simon and kirby the aesthetic of 
this cover is is a perfect snapshot of the time because the pulps are all the rage. This is and this looks like a pen and ink version of a pulp cover. Mm -hmm. You know, I can imagine this being painted and being on some, yeah. you know, cheap prose book. Also, when you take a look at super old golden age comics, something about the yellow ink holds up longer than all the other ink. It's always so freaking vibrant. Blue Beetle. Again, the, you know, Jack Kirby he didn't originate the Blue Beetle. It was something that was, you know, just a bunch of different ghosts. And, you know, he came in at a certain point. And, um, you know, technically, Blue Beetle is the first superhero that Jack Kirby worked on. So that, I feel like that's historically significant there. And it's, it, look at this. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's a nice selection of reprint strips as well. Get a good sample there. And again, the comics, just keep keeping up with the comics side of it. Yeah, all that, um, like, Terry and the Pirates, you know, all those, like, sort of aviation things, you know. Yeah, there's a, definitely that that merging of, like, superhero and something. In this case, a lot of, like, action-adventure kind of pieces. But you can see sci-fi would be an easy fit as well with that. Where it's like, it's so new, the superhero. Like, that mythology just doesn't exist yet they're inventing it it's so new that i mean that really is like a towel around that <laughs> its neck for a cape well this is like i think about like with superman's design and stuff like that like it's it's all coming from flash gordon and in the flash gordon comics it would be flash gordon uh just wearing a, a pair of underwear and a cape and that was the look and then that was the look siegel and schuster duplicated to make superman but it's it's essentially like you know like basically a naked body with a cape on it and and again like the the um the influence there is a John Carter, Warlord of Mars, and in the John Carter books, they describe him as, as being naked. So this talks a little bit about the uh, the partnership between Simon and Kirby and kind of like where their strengths would lie, you know, and Kirby pretty pretty early on starts doing most of the layouts and pencil work. Of course, Simon doing more of the business and selling this stuff, and they would get like 10-issue contracts and stuff for different books or different characters. All of that stuff's so interesting to me, that time period. You know, it's uh, it's like the Dreamer or something, Will Eisner's book, where you get to... Uh, it's a different world of publishing than you, what we encounter. You invented this thing, but now you have to invent the business of it and, and how how to make that part work. So there is opportunity there. That's how those shops, uh, you know, sort of came into existence because there was a need and the publishers like it's like you're doing a lot of the publishers work. If you come to them with a shop and a staff full of dudes, it's it's interesting, like. In, in like the stage that w that we're working in, there is not a huge demand for comics. Nobody's asking for comics, so your stuff's got to be pretty damn good, you know, for people to want it. Yeah, it's a good point. Much more competitive, I suppose, now than uh, whenever they were just like just put marks on the page. This <laughs> uh, these books on the press. This Red Raven, like whenever Kirby would like talk about it, whenever anybody would ask about, it, he's like, "Oh, it was a stinker. It was this. It was that." Um, because like it 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 got canceled immediately, didn't sell, but like. Looking back historically, none of that had anything to do with the content. It was kind of like canceled before they even got any sales figures. But like in Kirby's mind, like um, artistic uh, w like worth, like the value of a work was how well it sold. So if it didn't sell, it was a stinker. If it sold great, it was great, even though like we kind of have a different understanding of things, you know. It's really great. There are quotes from Kirby in here and it'll be about different jobs that would come up. And it's like, I was hired to sell this book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's real clear, like you're describing, Tom, it's really clear. Uh, we could probably all benefit from, you know, think about that a sure. little bit more. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. a commercial medium. Yeah. Like it doesn't, how do you get paid if you don't sell, if the books yeah. don't sell? But I think like as someone who's trying to like learn a craft, you're missing some valuable stuff if you're like dismissing work because it didn't sell. You're like, oh, well, I have nothing sure. to learn. I have nothing to learn for, you know, like, like New Gods would be the example because the word on the street was this thing didn't sell well and and that probably like hurt kirby like 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 a twisted knife and then it's like i guess that comic was shit let me do different differently you know instead he of taking those lessons there yeah you know and whether it's you know dc pointing him and saying hey do do one offs instead of like uh, mm -hmm. 40 issues that are interconnected but he definitely pivots so i'm sure some of that's on his mind of like well that didn't work let me try a different approach i was watching the uh, documentary of uh, easy rider aging bull and Roger Corman interview on there. The one movie that he made that had some critical success and was uh, up for award nominations and stuff uh, was the one movie he made that made zero profit. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go any other way. <laughs> hey, Red Raven, the first timely work. Uh, timely, of course, 
eventually Marvel Comics, so the first timely work that uh, Kirby with did. Marty, man, you could imagine, you know, little eleven year old Stan Lee with his ocarina in the room, and and you know, Simon and Kirby like were timely because prior to that, they would just farm stuff out and and get stuff, you know, you know from. Uh, uh, Bill Everett, you know, and Carl Burgos, that they were sort of outside, you know, they would buy this stuff from the outside. And then it was, you know, Simon and Kirby were brought in to be like the editor and art director to start an in-house, timely, uh, you know, comics department. And we get our first huge comics, historically, yes. the, the iconic covers of Superman, or uh, Captain America punching Hitler in the face. Uh Months, almost a year before we actually enter the war. Mm -hmm. uh, amazing, like hard to think about what that, how that lands. So much stuff going on there. Sabotage plans for USA. You've got the new invention of television. <laughs> yes, yeah. that television's incredible. It looks like an etch a sketch. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 his Nazis, right? Like, there's that video where he's talking about his experience in the war, and he's like, and he came at me. He looked like a butcher. And that's what all of the the physiognomy of all all of his villains have. That man. yeah, they look like pigs, and yeah. then and then like you know Hitler with like the pointy ears and and snout. Um, and this is all like before Kirby saw any military experience. Right. So I, I'm always amazed how credible his like depictions of war and and like uniforms and and fights are before he's actually like you know gotten in a boat and and you know gone to Europe. Yeah, it doesn't seem like a guy that's spending too much time in the morgue files, but certainly a voracious reader type. So he's he's consuming information, however you would do it in the 30s and 40s. Always love the four tier structure uh, of like the Simon Kirby stuff, and lots of middle shots where you see just full figures, whether they're bursting through the panels mm -hmm. if necessary or not. Man, like there are, there are hundreds of pages like this. It's very different than the uh, foreshortening that he would become known for, but extremely dynamic, even yeah. though it doesn't, it's not quite the same stuff that we would see him doing a lot of in the 60s. I mean, very dynamic. I, I guess dynamism is the goal. So whether you get there, you know, one way or the other, it, that's that's the goal. And that just like, yeah, the, the coming at you there, that, that shield, just mm -hmm. that little thin. And here's Jack Kirby's Batman. I know. <laughs> and... and uh, Something that stuck out to me was like on the cover you would see Jack Kirby. I mean you would I was say Jack Kirby punching Hitler, but you'd see uh, Captain America punching Hitler. But then when you'd open up the comics, in the comics it would always be like a much more humiliating fate that they would give Hitler. They'd be like you know give, giving him a hot foot or, or you know pulling down his pants or like yeah tr stripping him in the waist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which I think is like very effective. Uh, you know if you're trying to take somebody down, you know. One other thing I see in all of these is how much the figures are di are uh, on a diagonal. They're always moving almost, you know, with one exception whenever they're coming towards the viewer, something I don't think he's he's totally worked out yet. But for the most part, like, these figures are all 45-degree angles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the panel borders and things, you're starting to see kind of like Kirby Super circuitry strange. and squiggly stuff. Yeah, it's a really odd thing, and I have no idea where that comes from at this stage. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's funny to put it on Kirby tech. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't have made that connection, but it, it makes sense whenever you point that out. He's just coming in with all this energy and not sure exactly where to put it. So he just puts it everywhere. And then as he goes on, he learns to like make his, his uh, grids like very disciplined and then make, put all the craziness inside the panels. Right. Yeah. A lot of energy in these early pages. And his late work kind of starts going back in that direction. The stuff he does in the eighties, he starts having those lightning bolt zigzaggy panel borders. He tightens up so much in, in this DC work compared to that earlier stuff they were getting paid really well like this was like a you know uh you know um a Golden DC, age. yeah yeah they national really wooed him they really uh, you know wooed them away from from timely that's an awesome cover that star spankle comics it's like newspaper but having mm -hmm. all your characters featured really yeah, great can't can't do that cover justice if you don't have an amazing letterer putting putting the final chops on that yeah, I gotta imagine some of these editors would love this kind of stuff too. You think of those editors that want to put story on the cover and everything. It's a lot of room to play there. <laughs> and here's uh, uh, Jack Kirby and Joe Simon's Thor. You know, uh, you know, twenty years before the Marvel Thor. And then here's like, I mean, compare that to like um, Forever People number one, where they're like jumping through the boom tube in their little super cycle. Yeah, and and there's early Kid Gang, right? Yeah, probably some of the earliest of his like boy gang type characters and followed of course by more boy gangs mm -hmm. as soon as something starts to hit 
just just double down on it. So Boy Commandos, kind of cool. I picked up reprints of that early on because they would reprint a lot of this like in the 70s and stuff as like a back yeah. piece of a comic. And uh, if you have a good comic shop, you could get your hands on those pretty cheap. You know, like I, I, I shout out that, the fan of the ad. <laughs> <laughs> I got that Boy Commandos uh, at, at a flea market when, when I was a kid, maybe even before this. And it really works for a kid. You know, mm-hmm. I love those comics so much. I ended up with a Boy's Ranch, which is that same sort of thing. Uh, early in my reading, there was a reprint that I that crossed my path. Same deal. Like I, I was real impressed reading that because that's older Kirby but it's very easy to read and get into. They still haven't reprinted all the boy commandos either. There's like a couple, there's like volume one and two, but there, you know, there's a lot of this stuff that just hasn't seen the light of day. The other value of these books is always like, show me all the mm-hmm. photos you have. Yeah. Kirby at the drawing table in a bullpen studios, any of that stuff I am down for. So really cool to see that. You take a close look and you wonder like, is that the same drawing board that is in like the end papers? Of yeah. In like the... Thousand Oaks, California. Right. Yeah. yeah. Coast to coast with that drawing table. I would, I would stare molecularly at like the pencils he's holding. And it was sort of the first times I really saw uh, like original art in mm-hmm. any kind of context or something. So that was a little bit of a revelation. Sometimes you can find cool stuff like on the shelves and stuff where it's like, <clears throat> okay, there's a uh, Viking statue that he had that he would have there for handy reference with all that Thor stuff. Yeah, like again, this, this is like drawn by a guy who like hasn't done that yet, you know? Yeah. Must have been photos and things floating around, you know, imagine that, that golden age of uh, magazine publication as well. So... Something we're not getting much of now, but this is him going into the military, right? Going mm-hmm. into World War II, so you get to see self-portrait, pretty awesome, and uh, start to see his drawings that he's doing, I guess, while enlisted. What an amazing record that that he created for himself here, man. Like, when you have to imagine, like, my grandparents, my, my, my grandpaps don't have this kind of record and shit like that. Like, who knows what the fuck my grandfathers <laughs> did with their time, you know? I don't know if they had to get a couple shots of penicillin. <laughs> a, a time or two, man. Like, but it's it's like wholesome that Kirby's just chilling and, and drawing some stuff in pencil with his free time. These are great. I, I really like some of these poses of uh, the soldiers. Just gestural drawing. You know, it's the stuff they teach you. Like, get get it down quick and get the proportions. Don't worry about anything. It's always else. amazing whenever you nail like a detail in this kind of loose gestural drawing. Like, I think that thumb and the shadow behind yeah. the thumb is really strong, mm-hmm. and there's nothing there. It, it works perfectly, but it's such a simple drawing. More of the boy commandos, his division. Wasn't this always, like, as a, as a kid looking at this and seeing this character in that perspective, uh, it always feels weird to draw that far leg so small, right? But, like, it looks totally perfect, totally right, but that's a hard thing to wrap your head around when, mm-hmm. when you're tasked with doing it yourself. Yeah, and we saw, like, everything leading up to it, just thumbing through this book. Like, he's practicing, practicing, practicing that kind of stuff, and, and it's, it's just part of his bag of tricks now. Yeah, you wonder... Because I would learn that from copying a, a cartoonist that could do it. Yeah. But for Kirby, you wonder if that's like pages of drawing and then he goes like, this looks right. right. <laughs> do this. And these are stunning. Yeah. More of those kind of, uh, I guess, sketchbook journal kind of drawings just done out in the field. Oh, and just 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 dead guys. Like, that's so freaky. That's so scary mm-hmm. to think about, man. Like, yeah, you're around just like piles of dead people. This This shadow right here being cast off that arm was something I studied a lot. Like, like that was a revelation to me. Just those, that series of hatching was huge. Yeah, here's uh, Roz, <clears throat> here's Roz Kirby. He's going to go show her his etchings, man, whenever, <laughs> whenever he comes back. Like one of the letters to her. Look at the, the drawing that's on just the letter. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, they're already married by this point. Is he doing, like... He did a big stockpile of work before he went, yes. right? And so Simon continued to sell it or it was contracted or something. Because it seems like he's continuing to be published while he's overseas. And they talk about them really putting together work before, you know, they enlisted or were drafted or whatever. That's exactly it. Like, they knew it was coming. Guys were getting drafted. Yeah. Guys were enlisting. They're like, okay, we got this whole room full of young guys. Perfect draft, perfect draft age. So we got to start cranking and and these were like super prolific creators so they went in overdrive and created yeah this amazing like backlog of of material that that would run while they were overseas kirby wasn't uh contributing any like new work like he wasn't drawing comics pages in the fossil but um uh you know stan lee was able you know he was able to to still do some comics work 
you know, while he was he was in the military, and then uh, I, he's I, a pen, I, pencil pusher. I, I can imagine that Carl Weathers and Predator for everybody trying to picture this at home. I can imagine Stan Lee is a guy that has a like, bone spurs or or, or, <laughs> or some other convenient thing that's going to keep him off off his feet while while uh, overseas. And and Joe Joe Simon, I, I believe, was also able to contribute. I mean, obviously not as much as he used to, but it was you know he was stateside. He was in the Coast Guard, and he. He chose a different path than Kirby. Kirby was like, I'm going to keep working up to the last minute until they carry me out of here. And so he was eventually drafted. Joe Simon, like a little bit before that, was like, you know what? I'm going to try to find like a good assignment somewhere and, and volunteer. So he was he was Coast Guard. And, and uh, the Coast Guard, uh, as they were called in my dad's era, uh, the chicken of the sea. Because they they, uh, <laughs> they didn't do shit. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that was very different in our generation where the Coast Guard, uh, you know, like... Um, you know, were, you know, sent into active duty, like, first, I believe, you know. Look at those two different self-portraits, one 1943 coming out of boot camp or, you know, just enlisted, and then a year into the, into combat. You could find those examples, uh, like, on the internet where it shows the enlistment photos yeah, of he guys. Looks, he looks like he's aged 20 years. Yeah, yeah, it shows the enlistment photos of guys, and when they come back, the first photo, and you could just tell, you could see in their eyes that they saw some things. It's the mustache. Like, the Beatles looked pretty old, too, once they grew mustaches. <laughs> he, there are lines on the face, though, too. Like, look, yeah. at, look at the sunken eyes. Well, yeah, know? I mean, he's probably, like, you know, at the lowest weight That's he's true. ever been. He's, uh, you know, just constantly moving. Always great hair, though. Yeah, great hair. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, like, oh, like oh, that picture, th that video was circulating of, like, Stan Lee talking, like, without all his accoutrements. You know, ba <laughs> you know bald Stan Lee. And I was thinking, like, so, like, I, I, I kind of, like... T took a contemporary picture of Jack Kirby and drew sunglasses and a mustache on him, and he looked like a million bucks. Like, like, he, like Jack Kirby was already a good-looking guy, but you, you give him a pair of shades and a, and a mustache. Like, look out, Stan Lee. <laughs> <laughs> he just, he just, he couldn't bring himself to 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 do that. I'm waiting for you to do like the buddy fantasy books of those two guys oh, in goodness. the swinging 70s. <laughs> Mark Taunt and Riggs in California together. They relocated, and now they're getting the band back together. <laughs> <laughs> All right, post-war. So we're back in uh, the comics market, totally different. That's pretty fun to read about, too. Like, mm -hmm. you think of how young comics are and how much has changed in terms of genre, who they're selling to, ages of who's reading it. Kind of uh, pretty exciting to think about that evolution that happens, you know, in the first ten decade of comic books. It's, it's more or less they're doing the same audience. It's, it's just that first generation's gotten older. They've gone to... They were kids... Then they went to war, and now they're back from war, and they want to, you know, get married and have have a million kids, and and you know, and, and, and not, so you got romance, and not think about fighting as much. Yeah, like yeah, that's... make love, not war. <laughs> so one of the great revelations when I was a kid and get this book is like, okay, I've heard of romance comics, I heard those are popular. Wait, Kirby invented romance comics too, in addition to like all the stuff that I knew him for. That was another feather in his cap unbelievable it's something that's always dashed over too like we get like one page of that here and you know we go to conventions you know pre-covid times all the time right and there would be like big kirby panels with with people that we know and respect as kirby aficionados and stuff and uh never any mention of that stuff and every now and then like you know i'll be in the panel ask ask the question to just see if they could give me a little something it's like nobody's interested and you know what? Think about what an important ingredient that is in his like most popular work in the Marvel stuff. Like he's learning and, and doing these like quick little romance stories of people having crushes on each other and love triangles. That's an essential element of that Marvel formula. Yeah, no doubt about it. I love these stuntman covers that look like they're actual books, like that little 3D effect. Mm -hmm. I always loved those from the moment I got this book. A graphic novel. You know? Yeah, they feel like it. Yeah. <laughs> The other, of course, big genre that's coming out of that time period are the, the crime comics. Uh, dabbling in that, well, more than dabbling, but mm -hmm. also contributing to the, significantly to that one as well. Uh, pretty interesting, we looked at one of his crime comics in the days of the mob, which would have been 1970 or so, so you know, 25 years after this, but returning to that genre, and it's so much like you know, not trying to glorify it. Like, it's very clear his opinion of these criminals that are being uh, depicted in a protagonist position, but it, it was not okay. They weren't supposed to look good or cool or anything. This was an interesting period of, like, the Simon Kirby where where the hatching became, adopted that, like, Will Eisner train track yeah. drapery technique. It it didn't last long, but it was there, and it's definitely noticeable it, for this period of years. It's like a deliberate stylization, and, yeah. and we just think of, like, other deliberate stylizations that are like more 
associated with Kirby, but that was, yeah, that was is, an era. Is Simon the Inker on, on stuff like that? Because that's a very chunky brush, you know, it's very, very bold. I mean, everybody did everything, you know, back then. So it, 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 it could be Simon, it could be Kirby, or it could be like a number of guys in the, in their bullpen. I don't think Kirby drew this girl at all. I don't think, I don't think he drew that. Hmm, I wonder. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It looks like some Dan DiCarlo. Type Dan DiCarlo. Yeah. Uh, noteworthy, there's no Simon Kirby signature visible on that piece. So you're probably right about that, Ed. And you know, this, as opposed to here, you do see it on, yeah. on the other. Yeah, and that girl looks like a Kirby. <laughs> yeah, it does, yeah. Um, you know, and, and my date was kind of, that was like the segue into the romance com comic uh, era for them. Because this, I mean, this is technically a romance comic, but not really. It's more of like an Archie comic. It's, it's like a jokey kind of thing. Yes. But then shortly after that was when they started doing like the full on romance comics. Look at Swifty Chase. My date was Swifty Chase. That's the skinniest dude I've ever seen. You, everything Ichabod you, Crane standing every, there. Everything you need to know about the guy, too. Like, you can see in that one image. Like, you know, when you turn that page, that fucking paint is going all over that girl, and he's going to be on his ass, and that little ladder thing is going to be on its side. Looks a little like young Stan Lee. <laughs> That's funny to think of, too. Another comic strip that Simon and Kirby are pitching. You see even their names on the byline. I don't know if this was picked up or not. Um, uh, if it was, it didn't make much of a mark. Yeah, it wasn't picked up as a comic strip, but they did, like, you know, use some of this in an actual comic book. It was, like, you know, in stuck in, like, one of those, like, romance anthologies or something. I love seeing the blown-up panel, though. You know, you get to see mm -hmm. all those marks and stuff in detail. Uh, the hatching, like on the suit, where like you can see it's dashed off pen marks and stuff. Mm -hmm. That big wide brush adding some some heavy shadow. If Dave if Dave Sim is wondering, I don't think that dude, those are Nightingale strokes. It looks like <laughs> it looks like pen lines. <laughs> I'm with you on that. Uh, Charlie Chan was where um, uh, what's uh, uh, Carmen Infantino was working mm. for them, and like doing this like amazing Simon and Kirby imitation where it was like a Simon and Kirby style but really rigorous like drawing the hell out of like every little thing yet another popular genre of course the cowboys and westerns we'd see a mm -hmm. lot of Kirby art in that over the next 15 yeah. years look at that young James Cagney there's Jack Kirby there's Joe Simon and then <laughs> and then from that photo shoot there was also uh like Roz was involved too she was kind of like uh Damsel you know the, distress yeah, or something. exactly that's funny. Wonder where they're getting their guns, man. I'm sure those are real guns, right? I don't know. It could be cap cappers, man. There, we might have passed it, but there, there was a Simon Kirby thing, in, like in studio shot, not the Boy Commandos one, but you see like gun on the table. You see like a yogi with like some kind of headdress bust on that same tabernet. It's, mm -hmm. it's like like what's he drawing there? Yeah, I mean it was common to have like you know toy Physi guns for your reference, yeah. Young Romance climbed steadily from an initial uh, 100,000 copy sales till it peaked at 500,000. Isn't that incredible to think about? Mm -hmm. Like, like again, these the romance comics, like you said, Ed, they were impossible for me to find whenever I was like, yeah. oh, Jack Kirby Romance, let me see if I can find one of those. Never saw one of those for, for 10 years after this book. Uh, but to think they were selling half a million copies on a monthly basis, like, well, there's they were phenomenal. There's a ton of war comics out there. There's a ton of, you know, cowboy comics, a ton of romance comics. They just don't bring them to comic conventions because it's just not worth it. You know, they, you know, maybe now it's different, but like don't, classically, they just wait. When you them. think about the circulation and stuff, I, it's, it's kind of, you know, like in, in rap music, like the, the people who, the rappers who sell the most, they do this one thing that almost every other rapper doesn't do. And that's consider the other 50% of the population, mm -hmm. you know, like the LL Cool J will do a song for the girls here and there. And, and that will, you know, bring a lot of people into the game. It's the, the Fox news model where it's like, we're going to say everything else is the same and we're the different one. So half of you come over to our side because we're different than the rest. It's brilliant marketing. You know, you can find lots of examples throughout history of that, but yeah, it's uh, it's something. Again, comics could probably benefit from more of that kind of thought uh, these days. The Simon family and the Kirby family, and also they had uh, this young romance contract. Their contract negotiations earned them a lucrative fifty-fifty split in profits. Yeah. How much money must they have been making yeah. off of these comics at the time? Yeah, and I mean, yeah, they were making a ton of money, and you know, Jack Kirby was supporting multiple households. Basically, like he was like the breadwinner, you know. Is it, are you talking about it's a deal where he's taking care of Roz's family? Taking or care something? of, yeah, his in laws and stuff, yeah. 
glad those days are over. Yeah, maybe maybe by the fifties things kind of you know kind of started in the depression and then just continued, and, and maybe by the fifties everybody was you know got, you know figured some things out. Man, that's such a different model too. Because mm-hmm. like my dad grew up on a farm where it was like ten siblings, and it was just everything was the family. It was the yeah. house. Like everybody contributed in a lot of different ways. You know, whenever you're eight, you're picking rocks out of a field or something stupid, but it's still overall like part of this household taken care of, doing your part. I don't know that we have that too much anymore. Oh, yeah, no. we could do a separate uh, <laughs> episode for a, a very different YouTube show. Ch- changing, <laughs> yeah, changing values, I suppose. <laughs> and yeah, Boys Ranch. I mean, this this is like another one. Like Simon and Kirby were mature artists at this point, knew what they were doing, and they put everything into this. It's an amazing comic. It's great. Uh, market condi- conditions were just you know hostile at this time, so it, it didn't last yeah. very long. Kid, kid Westerns invented the mullet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is pretty good. Uh, cover dated October 51, so 10 years or more, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby's partnership, they're yeah. into it. You know, you talk about mature, and it's like, yeah, man, think how many pages they've produced in that in that decade. And superheroes are kind of out of the picture. They've been out of the picture for many years, you know, like like uh, um, Stuntman was like sort of like the last hurrah, and then it was, you know, nothing. So Tom, crickets. Tom, did the... Did the relationship fizzle in some epic way or just very natural growth apart from one another? Yeah, there's, Simon and Kirby? there's no like smoking gun. There's no like big story that they say where like, yeah, he did this or I did that. It just it, like I think it was just business. Like yeah. they lost their shirts. They were making a ton of money hand over fist. They start their own, you know, uh, you know, publishing company and put a bunch of dough in that and then the entire industry collapses. That, that mid-50s collapse, like the uh, Comics Code, the Senate hearing, all of that stuff, I think, is the time when that just goes yeah, south. It all, go, it, it all goes south. So they lost a bundle. This is pretty cool. This is a list of, uh, a partial list of artists that passed through Simon Kirby Workshop. Mort Meskin, uh, Bruno Prem- Premiani, who, Doom Patrol, uh, is, is how I know him. George uh, Russo's letters. Here. Ben Oda. What's that, Ed? Uh, George Russo's uh, misspelled right there. It's uh, they they refer to Martin Goodman as Mark Goodman, all <laughs> so it won't be the only name that's misspelled. A Mark Goodman but television. Steve production. Ditko, Ross Andrew, Carmen Infantino, Bob Powell. It's it's incredible the number of, of uh, artists that come through there. It's well, a really th- influential, you know, like tree of, of uh, cartoonists that at least got some experience under Simon and Kirby. You think about the respect Kirby had in the industry, like from other artists. And so, yeah, a big part of that is like just the work itself. But you think he was like, kind of like the, the boss, him and Joe Simon were like yeah. the boss for a lot of these guys. So they, you know, they probably did look up to him in that way too. Here's a Kirby quote. We did our best to give everybody a chance for a job, but I'd be embarrassed to tell you who I turned down and even more embarrassed to tell you who we let go. <laughs> so yeah, I'm sure that this is a, one of those fields that just ebbs and flows, you know, mm-hmm. like sometimes we're ramping up and selling stuff. And then other times it's like, got no work for you. Mm-hmm. One step above pornography. <laughs> Does pornography go out of style? I mean, it's just like you're you're looking over both shoulders, ready to pack up the whole the whole thing and then leave town at any moment. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah, this is that picture Ed you were talking about where you see all yeah. the props. So I mean, that's that's like a a, a toy store, you know, that cowboy does look gun. Like a toy, a uh, gun. You know, and you got this lion here. Whenever they have to do some kind of like jungle story. Look at the bow tie for just an attic studio session. I mean, they did they did get a camera out, so maybe <laughs> it was like, okay, guys, we're getting getting the the staff pictures taken today. Yeah, okay. look your best. Kirby, Kirby grab, grabs his belt, pulls his pants up to his nipples. <laughs> 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 yeah, these are uh, hand colored by Kirby. Amazing. So this is not color guides. Like he just, I, th- yeah, I would say this is like after the fact. He had either the original art or, or like a. It looks like it's the original art and just like for fun, you know, just colored it in. It looks like markers in spots. I mean, it's it's probably Doctor Martin dyes the same color he's been he's been doing, but yeah, but yeah who knows? Uh, and some of these he would have hanging in his house. Yeah, which is which is a kiss of death because if you saw this stuff now, like it's it's probably so faded. Like Doc Martin dies in inside of a year, like that it could fade completely. Yeah, it might be preserved by the crust of cigar smoke and oil <laughs> over it. Boy, those the boys ranch covers look great. Like how good is this of the two horses racing out at the reader? Yeah, this is like some of his best work. And when people would ask Kirby you know, up until he started doing the New God stuff, when people ask him, like, what's your best comic? What's your, what's your favorite comic you did? He would name a Boy's Ranch story called Delilah. 
Mm. That's good to know. That could be a future video here if, uh, if we have that it's one. It's a good story. Reprinted. I like these pictures too, Kirby and Roz. Mm -hmm. They look great. Yeah, there. what a great looking couple. This used to be the gimmick, like a, you go to the boardwalk or something and you would dress up in like the old, uh, yeah. put, put the derby hat on and the props and the saloon backdrop. All this stuff, the Boys Ranch, Bullseye, these things, like they started to get reprinted uh, no, not too far after this, man, uh, Fighting American as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and you would see the ads in the Marvel comics of the day. So like I'm talking like the Joe Matarera era of yeah. uh, X-Men, you would see hardcovers for for this stuff being... Yeah, Mar edited. Marvel published the Fighting American and the Boys Ranch yeah. reprints. Yeah, I think that's it, a strange time because that's like Joe Simon's going at them for Captain America around then too. It's very odd. I think in Kirby's fantasy life, he was a gangster. Like he, like he kind of like he imagined, like and he had guys in his neighborhood who went that way, and he didn't want to go that way. He wasn't going to go, but like in his in his dreams, maybe he went. You know, yeah. It's it's the same thing. Like you know, I have friends and family that lived in New York for a while and they all talk about the neighborhood in this like romantic way and how they were like tough guys I'm like listen man I, I know you pretty well like you're no fucking tough guy that's an amazing cover the bullseye cover with that like tapestry behind them bullseye is a great comic another one like this era of Simon and Kirby they're doing their own stuff they're doing it for themselves and they're putting you know every ounce of effort and, and experience into it this is an incredible spread because you go from something like that bullseye cover that's phenomenal to a very human very naturalistic in love cover of, of what looked like really good well-drawn figures and body language well so like a few pages ago we were looking at like stuff that they were doing that they had a financial stake in but they were doing for others like justice traps the guilty and you know young romance and stuff and so now these are the ones they're doing for themselves what was their, their own company what was their company called prize it was uh crestwood okay so they're doing so instead of Justice Traps the Guilty, they're doing Police Trap. You know, they're doing In Love. You know, they're doing, you know, Bullseye. So, and then and then these are the ones that, like, the the industry turfs out and, and they lose all their money. And, and the, the same way, like, they talk about, like, in relationships, the biggest fights are, like, about money. You know, it's, you know, they, they lost everything. I love this cover, too. The Psycho News, From Here to Insanity. Looks like a Mad Magazine ripoff, and it might be. It's 55. So yeah, it's yeah, it would be a Mag Mad Magazine uh, uh, ripoff. And then when... Um, like, uh, this, this got like repurposed in like an issue of cracked. Right. That night fighter partially inked piece is really awesome too. Yeah. A night fighter is kind of like one of those like bridge characters to Spider-Man. It's like when, when Jack Kirby and Joe Simon were working on like their version of Spider-Man, it's like, is night fighter part of it? He's got like boots where he can walk up the walls, you know? I stared at this foxhole cover for years like Very this iconic. was a piece that really stuck out to me i love the horror of like his bandaged face but i also loved like the lettering oh, yeah. of like it's like a letter you mm -hmm. know like a handwritten note on the cover just half of what i do in comics probably can be traced back sure. to this cover yeah Great any color too any way you can work like they talk about like natural lighting and stuff any way you can work natural lettering into something and it's yeah. like you know you know um and then um look a little closer too man dear mom the war is like a picnic, is what, yeah. he's, is what he's writing. We, and there's, we, there's nothing but brutality all around him. That eyeball, too, like the 40-yard stare of that eyeball. Which is like, those. that's the kind of letters he would write home. You know, it's like painting a rosier picture than what was going on because he didn't want to freak anybody out. And then um, a lot of these foxhole covers, you'll notice, have really idiosyncratic color. A lot of them are colored by Kirby. Um, and then this is, this picture, it's like one of the great images of like Kirby's career. Um, but it was re it referenced. There's a photo that he's referencing here. That's like, you know, pretty much that it's great hands. I like how it's framed too, that you get like this whole separate comic book panel on right. in there of just horror happening right over the guy's shoulders like this. That's very obviously like a Kirby color job. It is nice color. You know, purple, yellow, green for your background. Uh -huh. That's a lot of uh, his, interesting choices. His color was inventive, idiosyncratic, you know, unique. The usual suspects. <laughs> or uh, Love Rockets. Yeah. All right, Showcase. Starting to look like some of the comics that we recognize, right? Yeah. Getting into DC Comics and superhero comics. And, and this starts to feel, I guess, Silver Age. Yeah, I mean, this is like, you know, just a, a couple years and a couple degrees away from... The Marvel work, you know, yeah. Fantastic Four, and there he is holding Thor's hammer. <laughs> yeah, Fantastic Four is exactly what I thought of whenever I first encountered the the Challenger stuff. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh yeah, that's your that's your uh, prototype, mm -hmm. and I think that's probably how the text presents it. What company is Thrill? Thrill is a is a Harvey. Okay. 
Kirby trying everything at this Always point. Always love this guy right there. <laughs> uh, you know, like the, the comic book industry is in tatters. So he's trying everything. It's like, okay, maybe I'll get back into comic strips. And uh, drawn and inked. The, the top strips drawn and inked by Kirby. It's kind of cool. Again, you just don't see that much of his inking. Yeah, and trying everything. Like, you're really seeing it. All of these different strips that I guess didn't go, you know, unpublished. Um, Wally Wood inking. What a combo. Yes. Yeah, not the last time we'll see that that team up. They did some challengers of the un unknown. Mm -hmm. And here's uh, Thor's hammer. A guy finds Thor's hammer and, and starts having, like, the powers of Thor via the hammer a couple years before he goes over to Marvel. Again, all these covers are mm -hmm. just fantastic. Almost any cover that's in this book, it feels like they're perfect. And uh, some of these are Al Williamson inking him, mm -hmm. which seems like, talk about a match made in heaven. I like his robot. That was always one that stood out to me as being, like, a cool design. Yeah, he's just great robot designs. Real inventive. The robot hand. Yeah. That feels very, you know, contemporary. Like, you can easily imagine mm -hmm. that in the 70s. Oh, yeah. The, I mean, you see a very similar hand in Machine Man. So a pretty big run on Challengers of the Unknown, like a couple couple years worth. Yeah, it was it was like his bread and butter for for a while, and then um, you know had his his falling out with Jack Schiff, and then he was uh, persona non grata at DC. And Sky Masters, that's another one, Ed, that I'm sure we're going to look at at some point on this channel. But uh, a, another return with some Wally Wood inks on there, written by the Wood Brothers. One of those <laughs> insanely weird. Yeah, it's so confusing. By trying Wood to track Wood, it down. by Wood Wood, Kirby and Wood. Yes, and two Woods not related to the other Wood. <laughs> it's like a yeah, yeah a third, there's three Woods. <laughs> there's the Wood Brothers who are involved in the writing, not related to Wally Wood, and there's Wally Wood, the inker of exactly. a lot of it. This is cool. Race for the Moon. Uh, you know, Kirby, obviously big time into like space, science uh -huh. fiction, science fact, all of these things. But Race for the Moon was the one that Dave Gibbons was talking about whenever we interviewed yes. him and he has a piece from it. I think a cover or a splash yeah. page from it. A guy it. like tied to an asteroid. An asteroid, yeah. Another Kirby motif. Man, these, these look incredible. These Sky Master color pieces. Uh -huh. I'm a fan of this Me design too. right here in a very big way. Yeah, that's a nice layout for a cover. Archie. Yeah, had it gone on. You know, for more issues, we might have like, you know, a, like a hundred of these little movies. Complete sequences. I always love this kind of stuff, but anytime I have an idea that involves like something like that, like you're going to do 20 tiny drawings around the outside edges, yeah. it's like, that's the worst idea I have. Yeah, I've, I've <laughs> done a bunch that of that. One, editor. In, in G.I. Joe, I, I did a bunch of that, specifically referencing the, the double life of Private Strong, or the private life of Double Strong. <laughs> Race for the Moon covers look so cool. They look like uh, old paperback covers. They do. Yeah. Really neat. And I think that's Al Williamson doing a lot of the mm -hmm. things on the Race Race for the Moon yeah. covers. Man, he just did work everywhere. It's it's interesting that Marvel catches on the way it does, like with the Marvel Universe, when it's like he, he had, you know, pit stops and all of these publishers. Like in, in theory, like it could have taken off at any of these publishers possibly. Yeah, he was like this close. Like Challengers of the Unknown isn't quite... Fantastic Four. There are some important ingredient, ingredients missing, but it's not much. It's it's just like a, a little hint of something, and, and you're you're in another world. And not just success commercially, but artistically. Like. Yes, right. There was a, that Marvel book that we just looked at. There's a quote from John Romita, and he's talking about Stan Lee and what Stan Lee would do and how he would turn in the story, and it'd be like a 20-page silent story, and it parts wouldn't work for Romita, and it'd be like Stan Lee was like magic. You know, like that technique just fit what he could do and he would pull it all together and, and really kind of punch it up and add what it needed. You know, that's one of those secret ingredients, probably Absolutely. not so secret, but well, one of those ingredients that help, you know, I, like that I, synergy. I mean, when you're getting quotes from John Romita, I feel like he over <laughs> <laughs> he, he overplays the importance of Stanley. But I, I agree that Stanley did have important things. But for our entire lives, they've been crediting Stanley with being completely 100% responsible for those things, which I don't believe. I believe he's contributing something, but I don't... I, like, I think that if Jack Kirby wasn't at as restrictive an environment as editorially as, as DC was, he it w the, um, the challengers would have unbuttoned their top buttons, relaxed a little bit, and became human beings. And it was, it was the restrictive environment of DC rather than, than just Stan Lee being so awesome. You know, like, he obviously Stan had his role to play, but I don't think it's, like, specifically him. I love this era. 
whenever they start to do all of like the atomic monsters and, and sp giant space alien monsters and stuff, those are so much fun. And that's another one of those reprints that I could find as a kid. You know, you'd get those, those, Just uh, go right under the stairs at Ides, man. Yes. Always like 25 cents. I think, uh, with modern day inflation, my cost of 50 cents to like get some of these monster reprints. The crazy thing that would happen though, man, like I would go to Ides weekly and, uh, you never see the same one twice. Like I would just, <laughs> I would just grab whatever they would have, and they usually put them right up front. And they, none of them had covers, but like that splash page acted as a perfect cover, so provocative, enticing, and you never see the same one twice. Yeah. And uh, there's again, one of the little splashes, you know, to, to yeah. speak to what you're saying, Ed. All those splash pages were as good as the covers usually. We took a look uh, at uh, at the uh, Kirby Monsters uh, Artist Edition. Showed off a whole bunch of that stuff. Take a look at that video. Yeah, stunning. And, and like we're this close to the winning Marvel formula. All you got to do is get these monsters and these superheroes and these romance characters and these sci-fi guys all in the same room, and boom, you got you got Marvel Comics. It happens so naturally too. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a couple issues before t the FF get costumes, and we're, before you, they even deign to tie them into like the idea of superheroes. Yeah, I mean, here this could easily be just another monster comic. It's a perfect segue, you know, as you're going along from from pages of these monsters to that cover, and it even almost looks penciled, Tom. When I'm looking at this reproduction mm -hmm. version, like those lines are so grayed out. I see a lot of some of your pencil line mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, especially that ground plane and like the background, it looks uninked. Yeah. I mean, I, the, the like Marvel production department for the covers, um, great use of gray, you know, like, like throughout like Kirby's tenure at, at Marvel in the sixties. I am surprised by this book, not like, um, sweetening some of these covers that look a little bit, a little bit beat up color wise. Mm -hmm. It feels like you could make those a little more saturated. Yeah, I mean, I'd rather see this than 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 some you know chicanery. <laughs> and I mean, this is flat out a mistake. Yeah, it's the same thing printed twice. Yeah. So I guess it's the people at Blue Rose Press, man. Like, <laughs> they, go... Well, they, they to, in their defense, they had to do this like by hand, like on a board. It wasn't like popping out. Plus, thing plus and... at night after the Tundra yeah. employees went out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can see like that transition from Fantastic Four fighting a giant monster coming out of those monster comics into like now it's on. Like yeah. they have that the sci-fi elements, the space gods, the yeah. superheroes, and, and the bright and, colors. And they're going to be doing this for the next forty years, fifty years, like like uh, really up till forever. Today even, yeah. yeah, I don't think they're going to stop yeah. anytime soon. Oh man, there's that famous uh, Sue Storm piece that was yeah. taken from that uh, that that Playboy mm -hmm. illustration. You know, you ever want to goose the numbers on your Instagram? Just, just, <laughs> just compare the two, man. People, people absorb that like crack. The Kirby Amazing Fantasy cover. Yeah, this would always blow my mind too as a kid. Where it's like, clearly, this is the greatest comic book artist of yeah, all time. Yeah, what, what a revelation! Because I, this was all news to me. It's like I, I just knew Jack Kirby as he's just one of those guys. He's like, you know, John Buscema, John Romita. He's the super talented artist. Everybody loves him, but we all know Stan Lee is the real force. And then seeing like, oh wait, it's no coincidence that you know Kirby is Johnny on the spot, like, you know, through you know this, the, you know, this entire century. It's funny to see the Thor that ends up taking off whenever you see different iterations of Thor by Kirby before this. Mm -hmm. And of course, since then, lots of people have done their versions of Thors. But it's funny that this is the Thor that like yeah. becomes the comic book Thor. Yeah, that's T-ball Thor. And it's like, um, you know, it's like Superman. It's like they just inject a little more Superman. He's got the red cape, blue outfit, yellow belt, you know. Just a hit factory. One, mm -hmm. one after another. Yeah, it's shocking. It's such a right place, right time, right talent. Yeah. All of it lines up. Even you always hear about, like, uh, Manili as being the guy if he hadn't yeah. died. Hard to imagine, like, no matter how fast and well you draw, like, the creative part you're not going to be able to duplicate. Yeah, I mean, that's that, that Manili thing is, is bullshit. It's, um, it's, it's the Stan-centric theory of the universe that, like, Stan Lee could have... It's, uh, like, what they'd say, like, there was, like, the old joke about, like, Hillary Clinton, you know, at a gas station where it's, like, you know, uh, you know oh, imagine if you would have married that guy instead. And she's like, yeah, he would have been president. <laughs> you know, it's like that. It's the Stan-centric theory that Stan could have done this with any uh, jabroni off the street. And it's, it's just not true. 
<laughs> Love you, Joe Manili. Uh, rest in peace. This this is one of those early uh, X Men pages that was uh, super. It's super telling when you read this shit because like Hank McCoy is the thing, and you know he talks like a brute and stuff, and you just make the blonde girl a redhead, and she you know just stuff her in. I think. This might still be the time when the love triangle was the teacher yeah. is into the student mm -hmm. uh, type of gimmick, uh, wild stuff like like they this the X Men was their dud. That's funny too. It's it's mm -hmm. it's like it'd be funny to dig into that and think about like how does this miss? Like what's wrong? Well, what's missing? How did these guys not quite put this this the pieces of this one together? Here's the missing ingredient. Uh, Kirby just was spread so thin yeah. that got the least of his attention. Uh, he didn't stay on it. If he had stayed on it longer, if he would have stayed on it doing, you know, full pencils instead of, uh, you know, co-writing and layouts, um, might have been a different story. We this is this another one of the uh, the bad yeah. the printing snafus. We brought this up uh, with, with the uh, Abrams Marvel book uh, I brought up, Tom, and, and I wonder if you could speak to this uh, to, to any degree, man, but, you know, Avengers 4, this is where we bring back... Uh, Captain America, we brought back Namor in the issue of uh, Fantastic Four, obviously the Human Torch in Fantastic Four number one, uh, a couple other characters along the way, Vision will, will come back, and all of it was really in regards to just maintain the copyright yeah. within the Marvel house, mm -hmm. but Jack Kirby's a hatchet man, so like my question is, is he even conscious of su such things? Is it Stanley just like, oh, yeah, let's, let's bring back that Captain America, or do you think that he actively you know, was was a participant in, or, you know, that he was conscious that, that, that he was he, fucking over Joe Simon, yeah, especially. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I would guess that, um, that, you know, he was, it was like, you know, his deal with the devil, and not deal with the devil as in, like, oh, Stan Lee's the devil. It's that, it's like, I want to have a fucking hit book. I don't give a shit. So it, it you know, I, I'm of a mind to think that it, it you know, uh, you know, Jack Kirby says he was the one who wanted to like bring back, you know, bring bring in the superheroes, bring back. He always preferred to do original stuff as opposed to you know reviving something old. So uh, I mean, I, I I think he had to be like a, aware and you know morally cul culpable, you know, for the the decision whether it was something that was suggested to him or whether he was the originator of it. Um, but again, like I don't, you know, I I I think he still slept at night. Like that was like the least of the things he's done in his life that might ha cause him a restless night of sleep. Sure. It's probably something at the time, like he wouldn't have been conscious of what the legal ramifications of that sort of decision were probably. I wonder, I mean, I know that, um, you know, like the ins and outs of the legality, sure. But I think, uh, you know, you know, just like the, 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 the moral or ethical aspect. And also, I mean, he was involved, like he was involved in running his own publishing company and running. So he, you know, there, for in the in the fifties, he was the boss. There are yeah. the stories of like Carl Burgos just like twiddling his thumbs, like waiting for right. the Human Torch to lapse so that he could get it back and 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 start making Human Torch comics again. And then Fantastic Four one comes out and he goes crazy, creates Captain mm -hmm. Marvel, does does all that stuff. So so like the creators knew, and I imagine Joe Simon knew. That yeah, it's, it's probably true. Captain yeah. America's coming back. When, when Jack Kirby talks about the Captain America stuff, he does talk about it as like, hey, I had my back against the wall. It's like, I, I wanted to keep working here. It was doing great. And, you know, it's like, if I don't sign this thing, maybe all this work's going to dry up just like it dried up at uh, DC because I did something that, that the brass didn't like. You know, it's like he was in a very tenuous position. One of the great covers, man. Yeah, no doubt. That's another one of those great, like, look at the spread of, yeah. of, of that base. <laughs> Both of those guys. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, it's Kirby's, like, dyna dynamism and, and uh, perspective and, and anatomy, like, pushed to its limit. You know, you're, you're not going to, like, this would be a candidate for, like, oh, the most Kirby, Kirby, you know, drawing of, of people. Definitely one of the pieces that guys like Neil Adams and Jim Lee pull out, like, it just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it really doesn't, but man, it makes great picture sense. Mm -hmm. You listen to uh, Neil Adams, and then this is sinew, this is muscle, this is <laughs> sinew. It's genius. Yeah, it's sinew, muscle, lighting, reflection, all kind of like merging into each other. I always love that Sergeant Sergeant Fury cover with mm -hmm. Captain America. And there's some sinnetisms in that Daredevil cover too. Love that pencil piece. 
Yeah, this so is so tight. It's all there. This is late, 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 late Kirby. Yeah, you know, and you can and tell just by the signature. I wouldn't be shocked if there was like a little bit of Mike Thibodeau in there too. So this is coming to the end of Kirby's Marvel mm-hmm. first Marvel run, mm-hmm. uh, late late sixties, you know, sixty nine, uh, heading to California and heading to DC Comics, and uh, we get the in the days of the mob comic pulled out here. Yeah, those were like the big promises he got from DC was yeah. that he'd be able to do these full color gloss magazines. This was so cool. The watercolor, like the character designs for some of these fourth world characters and seeing them like this, yeah, mind blowing. You know, like I'm just into four color comics at this point. So mm-hmm. when you start to see like watercolor on top of the inks and it's Kirby art, it was just like, what is this? Well, yeah, this like Orion... When I was a kid, I'd see this guy in like maybe a John Byrne comic, and I'm like, that guy is super cool. Who is that guy? You know, and then it's like, here he is, and Jack Kirby created him. And you love Dark Side on Saturday morning cartoons. Well, guess what? He's got a son. He's got who's there's there's all those bad guys that were on the cartoon. There's good guys too. And these pieces were inked by Don Heck, uh, and then colored by by Kirby. I didn't realize that. I was thinking that was all Kirby's hand. But... Yeah, yeah, it's it's Heck inking because Kirby was he was putting a team together. You know, where he's like, um, I'm going to make my own comic company. It's going to be DC West Coast. And John Romita, you come over. You know, John Severin, you come over. Like, he, he was trying, uh, Don Heck, you come over. Like, he was trying to put together a bullpen, and, and he would be the boss. And, and you know, John Romita was like, hey, Stan, Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I mean, John Romita said he was extremely tempted. He was re- he, he was going to he was gonna pencil um, Mr. Miracle. Wow. And he was ready to do it, and his wife was like, are you crazy? You're going to go work for Jack Kirby. Like she basically said, like, I, like who knows what else she really said. You're going to work for that crazy motherfucker or whatever. But like, like Ramita says that yeah, his said, wife has a filthy mouth. <laughs> no, she, We've all heard these stories. <laughs> uh, she said to him that if you, uh, if you go work for Jack Kirby, you're just going to turn into a Kirby clone. They're just going to, you know, he's going to, you know, you're going to fit into his mold. You're going to start drawing. Like, like you got your own personality. That was his, his uh, story. I love that. Mr. Miracle. Really Love awesome. those colors. I, I, I yeah. like the, the the final color scheme. Mm-hmm. Sure, um, yeah. But man, that looks really cool. The mask, everything. Yeah, he it's seems really like great. he might be like an insect based creature based on those colors. Because Kirby was not a hundred percent sure exactly like who these characters were, what they were gonna like the drawings. A lot of them, they were still up in the air. It's like, okay, I want to fit this cool looking guy in here. I want to fit this cool looking guy. That's an amazing number one cover of Mr. Miracle. Mm-hmm. The New Gods is neat because it's so based on that watercolor scheme, yeah. which doesn't really make sense in comic books. Yeah. Uh, so pretty wild for a cover. Even you can see it in mm-hmm. his face, the way the face has like that color lighting applied. Yeah, it might not fit in with comic books as, as we knew them, but certainly the kind of like psychedelic era of like late 60s, yes. early 70s, mm-hmm. black light posters. Yeah, it's really wild through that lens. Like he has green eyes and stuff sticking out from that helmet. And, and Kirby at this time was very consciously trying to get out of like just the way comics are done. He wanted to make things that were appealing to like a wider audience. And yeah, so, you know, psychedelic, like what was what was of the moment? So yeah, psychedelia. There's the great story about him telling Infantino wanted him to do one of the bo- a book that was already being published by DC. Yeah. So he said, "Give me the lowest seller mm-hmm. with, that doesn't have an artist on, on it," and that's how he gets Jimmy Olsen. But that's one of those stories that like it feels like it's DNA of Jack Kirby's uh, mythology. Mm-hmm. May not be the first time that story's told, but right, this is yeah. probably the first time I read it in mm-hmm. print. Always the splash pages just always stood out, and the two page splashes just mind-blowing yeah this i I always think of this double page splash because there's like so little like specific plot or story going on like you have this enormous room that he's drawing the hell out of and then all the characters that are talking are just in this tiny little like it it's so like it goes against like the how to draw comics the marvel way or how to draw comics the jack kirby way but it's like amazing yeah for sure and he was so great with scale where you'd see like the gigantic sculpture or whatever of the figure and then the figures flying around it and interacting with it in space and also the negative space of some of these like splash pages and the way they would do lettering Mm -hmm. that always stood out to me when i finally got hold of some of these and was like that's really weird choices man the commandy cover's great not hard to imagine selling that book 
Yeah, I mean, look at the, like, like I, the first time I saw this, I'm like, what the fuck? You know, like, I was a huge Planet of the Apes fan. It's like, oh, this is, like, better than Planet of the Apes. He really takes advantage of that scale when he's doing two-page spreads Mm -hmm. in this era. Reminds me of, like, Hitchcock talking about, like, you do a long shot to establish everything. It feels like these two-page spreads, almost always, it's like, we're going to establish a world in this shot. During the, like, like his 70s work, like, when I was buying this stuff in comic shop where it's all sealed up, if I'd buy, like, a 70s Kirby comic and then crack it open and there wasn't a double-page splash, I'd be so disappointed. (laughs) Yeah, I could see that. Love that Iron Man cover, too. Really awesome. The Eternals coming soon to a Cineplex. Yeah, so coming back to Marvel after uh, kind of an unhappy yeah. unhappy ending there at DC. Feels like this is entering into that phase of just disappointment. The the comics sure. breaking your heart. It feels like yeah. this is the decade An- where an- we're just going to see it. Anticlimax. Leaves yeah. Marvel in the 60s, leaves DC in the 70s, and it just feels like, man, did they not do right by him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's just, like, the phase of life he's in. Like, he was trying to segue into, like, a more, like, o- overseeing kind of kind of role, and it just didn't happen. And it's, like, a guy who's, like, you know, in his late 50s and going into his 60s, like, sh- shouldn't be the, the guy in the trenches anymore. You know? after, after after Neil Adams comes out, man, like, like the, the fans just turn heel on on that style. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not looking for it, man. And, mm-hmm. and, and it's the people he's working with in the bullpen or having disrespect for him, wanting mm-hmm. to do Fantastic Four over again. Like, fuck. With them writing. Devil Dinosaur and mm-hmm. shit like that. Yeah, Devil Dinosaur was going to was gonna be like a, a Saturday morning pitch. So. Makes sense. And, and you know, we're getting into like the Ruby Spears animation work that he would do, I don't know, for the last decade or so of his life, uh, you know, working in animation, doing some comics at the time too. But uh, getting away from comics is the primary source of income. Silver Surfer graphic novel was it was an interesting book from that era, that late seventies time. Yeah, that was how they cropped it, man. It was like took far more of the carnage out of the piece, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it was you know toned down for for um, the, the final printing. Um, this and this is like the like only instance where like the Silver Surfer graphic novel says like copyright. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, you know, like all, all this other Marvel stuff, you know, no, nothing within range of that is going on. Captain Victory and Silver Star, the uh, the creator own comics that mm-hmm. he gets to do at Pacific. Checking out this stuff made me think that maybe it the Argo stuff wasn't like declassified at this moment. You know, all the CIA weird, weird stuff. Like, it, it wasn't. It wasn't until, I think, maybe the late 90s or early 2000s that's that it pretty... got declassified. So, like, I read about all that, um, the the Argo stuff, I read about all that as, like, oh, you know, here's some movie that Jack Kirby was working on, doing art for, blah, blah, blah. And then it was, like, a couple years later, it's, like, in, like, Rolling Stone magazine, like, oh, that was all a CIA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a weird story. In the movie, the the guy who plays the nondescript comic book uh artist is um that real ugly guy that played walter kovacs rorschach in the watchman movie <laughs> man this this stuff is great and um you know a lot of this stuff done you know i think this was like new gods era stuff that he was working on and then this is um you know like just like you know biblical you know drawings for you know for his own amusement I love how this stuff like like imagine new gods all looking like that mm-hmm. that is a wild visual yeah, I sometimes think like when they do like reprints of like New Gods and stuff, if or even like Fantastic Four, if they actually like just print like a photo of his collages, you know, and, and touch that up as opposed to like the, the that'd be good. The other thing is like seeing the stuff that he colors in this book, mm-hmm. and you were pointing out some of those covers. Man, it's a different color sense. Like even yeah. if they could have gotten more of that kind of color influence on the New Gods pages or on any of his comics pages, it would have been one more dimension of just. Uh, you know, the, his unique point of view. Because his colors definitely look different than most comics. Like, Kirby was an artist, like, within, like, an industry, you know? But if he were an artist, art, like, if he were a proper artist doing things, you know, like, maybe even doing comics, but doing it instead of, like, as an employee or, or, or a freelancer for somebody, yeah, it would have, like, think of the unified vision that his body of work would have if he were coloring, drawing, and doing it at any size he wanted, any, you know. Mickey Mouse piece that he did for a Disney publication, <laughs> the the muscled yeah, mouse. That might be like his last drawing, and that that showed up in yeah in like a Disney book, and and again he- heavily uh, assisted there. 
and then showing you know fans of his uh, mm-hmm. professionals, of course, but but uh, fans of his doing tributes to him. I think this was through San Diego Comic Con, which was uh, always pretty closely associated with Kirby. I think he went from the beginning. Yeah, that was that seventy fifth birthday party that he had at, at San Diego. That like a ton of people were there, and, and you know some friends of ours were there too. Friends of ours or friends of yours? <laughs> <laughs> uh, between 55 and 78, Kirby average uh, 52 pages, four covers every month. We'll, we'll get to we'll get to the the stats, the one uh, stat because like all right, okay, cool, legacy. legacy, yeah, pretty strong when you can have Mobius there as part of your legacy. Mm-hmm. There's Kirby with uh, 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 Jerry Siegel. Billy Mumy, Bob Kane, uh, uh, Miguel Ferrer, and Mark Hamill. And who's this? Oh, yeah. I like this a lot. It's a collage of his war stuff mm-hmm. somebody put together. Do more of that. Yes. And also, um, love to see just more and more shots of like his tools. Yes. His Absolutely, work area. Man. Love it. Love the jam piece because look, we got Reggie Byers. Yes, right in the middle. In the mix, sure can. Like this is the this is a perfect snapshot, man. I see I see Gilbert Hernandez in there. Don Simpson. Ducks are still a thing. Like it's all black and white explosion people. Troll lords. Wow. You know, uh, jam pieces haven't changed much over the years. <laughs> <laughs> You can skip ahead, man. It's all the 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 actual comics works he's di- he's done, the characters yeah. that he's created in alphabetical order, bibliography, and then, and then publication. The very last page on the inside uh, is the career stats piece, which is, by the way, all very valuable for me getting this book and totally. having like all of that stuff called out. Totally, really appreciated that. Yeah, and the career statistics you're talking about, Ed. Here, let's bl- let's blast some of this out for the audio listeners. Yeah, man. Then. Career totals. 20,318 pages of art, 679 pages of layout art, 1,385 covers. Big number, but that still feels light to me. Well, I'll, I'll bet it's been amended since then and, and more, you know. But then you have the averages, so it's like 376 pages uh, each year. I do wonder what where they set that, that bar, like from what year to what year, because that shrinks the number a lot. You think about like the output in the 60s had to be so much more, but then... You have these little pieces like most pages published in a single year, 1,158. I mean, that's basically 100 pages a month. You, you <laughs> know, like that's that's uh, for a year. That's, wow. I could, I could uh, in a good month, get 10 pages done. Most pages published in one month, 1947, 142 pages. I'm surprised that's 47 and not a 60s. Yeah, I mean, like think about that for productivity because like that's a 20-year gap between like his busiest year and his uh, busiest month. That's pretty remarkable you know i mean that's that's your apex in terms of productivity and he's got that for 30 or 40 years the 60s were his like most like sleepless nights so i think probably in the 40s his uh life was a little simpler didn't have as many kids uh it could could draw you know you you could draw a little more crudely uh in the 40s than you could get away with in the 60s maybe yeah fair points so most covers in a year, 102 in 1964. It's a pretty good year. His period averages, man, 600, 670 pages a year. So it's like two pages a day. Yeah, it's astounding. It was impressive whenever I was a kid. I feel like it's just as impressive now. And I love the suggested reading list. I feel like we, we see those in the back of every book that we look at that's about comics. But like pre-internet, man. You yeah, know, what else did you it have? It was huge. That's how you'd figure this stuff out, you know, if you cared uh, and if you had access to comic shops or somewhere that you might actually find some of these books. Fantastic dusting this thing off mm-hmm. uh, after so so much time. Uh, doubly fantastic to hang out with you, Tom, and, and uh, shoot the shit and go through this thing. Yeah, it's it's what a body of work. And yeah, I, it's great talking to you guys about it. Is this a book, Tom, that you used for your book? Is this something oh, you sure. consider basic? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty I, yeah. early in the Kirby uh, like biography. Yeah, list. I mean, it, it, you know, you can't, yeah, you. I mean, there, there's like there's like little bits and pieces here that like you're not going to get other places. You know, like the story of Kirby drawn on the walls of his apartment building and stuff. Yeah, there's like a couple key things that yeah that are in here. And again, it, this, this and like the early Jack Kirby collector issues. That was that was like you know day one for for me like learning about Jack Kirby. So it's yeah, you know, it, it all started there for me. 
Okay, favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, what's out there, man? Patreon.com slash Jim Rug, where you can download my out-of-print, hard-to-find zines and mini-comics. I think I have about a dozen of those available now. Lots of original art and how I make comics. Patreon.com slash Jim Rug. Tom, what do you have? Uh, read Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. Follow me on Twitter at Tom Scholey. Uh, check out my Patreon. Just search Tom Scholey on Patreon.com. And uh, check out the Total Recall show on YouTube. Red Room Comics are out in the wild. Uh, as of June the 30th, there will be two issues uh, in print with new comics uh, every four weeks or so. You can pre-order the comics at the Fandographics website. Get to put them in, on your pull list at your local comic shop. If you want to read the comics ahead of time, hit up my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks for the archive there. I'm into the fifth issue's worth of comics. Put new strips up every Tuesday. You can get there by way of my link tree in the description below this video. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Jimmy, give them one last set of marching orders, man. We're going to be on our way. Read more comics.